So our first session of the afternoon of Big Talk from Small Libraries, we are ready to start with that. Um, uh, Heather, uh, Heather Biederman is here with us. Good afternoon, Heather. Um, Good. Yeah, from uh, South Central College in um, North Mankato, Minnesota. And you are FTE, um, you are 2746, 2746. Still that sound. sounds about right. I think I have it in my presentation somewhere too, so we'll uh, we'll see you when I get there. <laughs> and um, she's going to talk to us a bit about doing using book challenges um, in small libraries, intellectual freedom, something that is a huge topic at the moment, of course, in um, all libraries, but um, something that small libraries may have to handle in a specific way, in their own way. So um, I'll just um, hand it over to you, Heather, to tell us about how you're doing at your library. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it, it is a snowy day here in Minnesota, and I am really glad to be with you today talking about a really serious topic of book challenges. And I work at a small library. Um, I am at South Central College in North Mankato. I put a little a map, so if you're not sure, it's south of Minneapolis. And um, actually, I'd say it's accurate because the whole state looks white right now because we have about 18 <laughs> inches of snow here right now. So it is a lot more snow than I'd like, but you know, it is what it is. And, uh, and here's the number, 2,746 full-time FTE students on my campus. So we're a smaller school in the state of Minnesota, but um, real busy, and that's a good thing. I'm also uh, the chair of the Intellectual Freedom Committee at the Minnesota Library Association. So this is something that's near and dear to my heart. And I am always glad to, um, to meet all of you and to talk more about it. So I'm just going to say that I have a lot of links in my presentation today. Do not panic. You don't have to write everything down. I'm going to share my slides after the presentation is done. But if you need to um, see it, send me a note. I have my email at the very end, or you can uh, look on the um, website and you can find me. But send me a note, and I'm always happy to talk more about all of this. So. Um, today we're going to cover um, just a little bit of um, a dabbling because 50 minutes is not enough to get into this giant iceberg of a topic that is sinking our ships all over the country, all over the world. Um, book challenges are happening at an alarming rate. Um, but for a small and rural li library like ours, um, you know, it can be especially traumatizing when you are one of the only people working in a library. I'm going to tell you a little about intellectual freedom, what book challenges are, um, some examples, uh, how to collaborate so it makes it a little easier on you, and um, talk about the importance of clear policies, procedures, and then actively engaging with your community. And I'm gonna give a little bit of time for q and I know we're moving at a fast pace, so we probably don't have a lot, but if you think of questions and we don't have time to answer at the end, send them to me. I'm happy to go over it. So in the news this week, today, um, someone in, from my Intellectual Freedom Committee actually sent me this, and um, it shows to me how important this topic is because, um, all around the country, libraries are being um, really held hostage by book challenges. And the one that um, she sent me this morning was about a Florida teacher who is a substitute teacher was fired for um, filming the library. He went into the library and he did a film of um, the shelves that they had to take all the books down from the um, book challenge. They had um, new laws that were saying, basically you need to um, go over every single book to make sure it's not these topics, which are usually, um, by the way, um, LGBT um, is usually what it's focused on. So there's a lot there. I'm just going to push forward and there's no sound needed for this, but it's horrific to see um, the shelves were bare and um, this poor teacher was fired for showing it because he was horrified too. Is um, All the books were taken off. Um, almost the whole fiction section was wiped out. Um, just so they could go over um, these rules to make sure that they're in compliance. So it's something to think about when you are uh, looking at the importance of these kind of policies and how they affect you and your library. So intellectual freedom is the big 
uh, overview of everything underneath with these book challenges. What is intellectual freedom? It is the right of anyone to seek and receive information from all viewpoints without restriction, providing free access to ideas. Um, the First Amendment, you a lot of people, oh, the First Amendment should protect it. Um, it's the right of freedom of expression includes intellectual freedom and the individual's right to receive information. So that's part of what libraries do in this. And the difference between censorship and intellectual freedom is intellectual freedom is a basic right. Censorship is when someone objects to an idea, information, and then access to that information is banned. So there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, censorship can be anything um, suppressing ideas, images, information um, that groups or people find objectionable or dangerous. And, and when I say groups, I'm going to be focusing a lot more on groups today. But um, in the past, it's been more like a parent will come and say, I, I don't think this book is appropriate for my child to see. It's usually, um, they get really worried about anything that has to do with sex in our country. So you'll see a lot of that. Censors seek to limit freedom of thought and expression by restricting spoken words, printed matter, books, um, and our electronic resources. So it's getting to be more and more what it is and what it is not. Censors pressure public institutions like libraries to suppress and remove from public access information they judge inappropriate. So no one else has a chance to read it and to decide for themselves um, to make up their own minds. They want to decide for everyone that this is a, something that we shouldn't have here. And not all speech is protected by the First Amendment. People are free to express themselves, but false or libel statements are not protected under the First Amendment. So things to think about. And what is a book challenge? Most of you should already know since you're probably having them already, right? But um, according to the American Library Association, a challenge is the attempt to remove this material based on the objections of the person or group. Um, the banning is the actual removal of those materials and they do not simply involve a person expressing a point of view saying I just don't like that um, usually there's a formal complaint that has to be lodged and there's a bunch of policies that go in to make sure that it is done appropriately you know just because somebody says they don't like it you shouldn't just take it off the shelves I don't like this cookbook you know no there's a lot more to it so you're seeing it a lot more. And I know um, when I first was a baby librarian, you'd see it every so often, but it has exploded. Um, since uh, after 2020, we're seeing um, in like 2021, they had 729 attempts to censor library resources. Um, now, um, the last time I checked in August, 2022, there was um, up to 681 bans and it has suppressed, sur surpassed that. So 1,651 unique titles were targeted. And we're seeing more than 70% of the censorship attempts targeted on multiple titles. So what's happening is there are groups, usually parent groups that are sending um, packets, um, huge lists of um, books that they are feeling like they don't want to have on the shelves, usually in K through 12, also public libraries. Um, I work in an academic library. We don't see it very often, but it's out there. And you get people that are very targeted to certain books and they don't want to see them anywhere. And we're seeing it rising. Um, we're seeing it's uh, usually uh, about 40% are uh, started by parents. We'll see 24% by patrons. You'll see it in the board or the administration, which mind you, um, things to worry about is that a lot of the groups that are targeting uh, book challenges are finding political ways to get power so they can push this through. They're getting people put on to library boards, they're getting people put into city government, state government. They are going all the way to the top so they can um, sometimes even remove librarians or people who are in the way because this is an agenda. 
Um, and uh, interestingly enough, um, 6% librarians and teachers are um, doing challenges. And I think sometimes that's because they may think it's inappropriate for the reading level, it's inappropriate for the age level. So it, there are good reasons to question things, but we're seeing it to be at a level where I feel that it is um, hate masquerading as concern. And that um, that the reason that people are protecting for the children is um, is sort of uh, a way to get the majority of people to go along with it. Whereas, is it actually a good idea for someone to get rid of a book? And most of the people haven't even read the books or even looked at the books that they are um, saying should be banned or challenged because it's mm -hmm. coming from groups, right? So where they take place, 44% are school libraries, so for the kids, right? 37% um, public libraries, 18% schools, and 1% academic or other. And we're seeing most of them are about books, but we're seeing more and more of them about displays. Here in Minnesota, we had a, um, uh, a challenge to a display about both um, LGBTQ, um, I think it was, um, I think it was in June, and then they had um, Black Lives Matter display, and both of those were taken down um, with a lot of discussion. So it's not just books, you're seeing more and more things like films and others. So just be aware that it is going across the board, not just books. And we're seeing it all around the country. Um, it's a lot more, um, I'm in Minnesota, so I'm noticing it says one to 10 bands per, um, per school books, um, per, per group of people. So and then you'll see like uh, down in Florida where they had the new rules, um, it's like a darker red and uh, Texas, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so look at where you live in the country or, you know, if you're Canada, you know, think about where, where are these challenges coming from and, and how it's spreading out through the country. And, and I would just like to note that that um, data is through June of last year. I know right. that here in Nebraska, we do have, we're in, we're in that gray zero. Well, oh, yeah. we're not. We're not anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> oh yeah, and I was saying, nor looking at North Dakota, they just had some rules go through, so they're having a bunch too. So, yeah, so. it has exploded. You are yeah. so right. <laughs> <laughs> so don't, yeah, don't feel complacent. Like, oh, I'm in Nebraska, there's nothing there. I don't have to worry. Yes, you have to worry. <laughs> we all have to worry. This is, um, it's really taking over. And um, I, I, I laugh at this every time I see this clip. Um, why is it happening now? This is from um, the Marx Brothers, you remember them? Um, the Horse Feathers movie, and I should have done a librarian trigger warning on this. Um, books were hurt in the video clip. Um, <laughs> uh, there, there are a lot of reasons for book challenges, and some good, um, but some very nefarious. I feel like there's, um, it used to be a book challenge would come from a parent, concerned parents, I love them. And it's a good time for a discussion and to say, you know, you know, you always have a right as a parent to um, decide what your kids read and what they don't read. But do you feel like it's something that you should decide for everyone's kids or every kid? And I would prefer that people, instead of focusing on getting rid of books, say, well, you don't like that book. Are there other books that you think would be good to add to the library that would, you know, help round this point of view out and, you know, have a discussion about it. I mean, you know, it may not, it may not be a de-escalation moment. You know, I always feel like it's a good time for conversation. You know, you have a parent come in and they're probably angry because little uh, Bobby is reading something that they thought was inappropriate. And, you know, like, let's talk about it, but like calm people down, relax, breathe, and don't get judgy. You know, that's, that's going to be the hardest part for a lot of us, especially like, you know, I work in a library where we have two employees here, and then the other campus there, they have two employees, 
and they are 40 miles away. So we are not a united front where we can all just back each other up. Um, and some of you may be the only person in your library and maybe have volunteers or maybe you're, it's just you. Um, you may have administrators who have no idea um, what you're about, why it's important to protect intellectual freedom in your library and to go against book challenges. They may be like, oh, you know, um, this parent wants us to get rid of a book. It's just not worth the hassle. Just do it. Well, if you start doing that, eventually we're going to have no books. They're all going into the into the garbage because nobody stood up for them. And, and we it's we need to stand up for them. We need to uh, be defenders of freedom and the freedom to read and ideas and be passionate about it. It's really easy to just go complacent and go, OK, but don't do that because that's the slippery slope where we start burning books and what's next. <laughs> so but why is it happening now? I, I do believe that there are a lot of parental groups around the country that are working together. And I'm going to show you a few um, that I've found that um, are um, really getting traction. And I think they are the main instigators of this. And you'll see again and again, it's the same kind of lists of the same kind of books, the same kind of ideas that they want to go against. So. They reflect on the work of growing number of advocacy organizations that have made demanding censorship of certain books and ideas in schools part of their mission. And that comes from the PEN America page, which is a great resource too. So the activist groups that I'm talking about, there's a couple I'll mention. There's way more than this. I hate to say it, it makes my stomach kind of turn. Is there parent groups like Moms for Liberty, that um, the last time I checked it had over 70,000 members in, it said 33 states, but I think it's more like 45 states at this point, 165 plus chapters. They're everywhere. Ron DeSantis, um, they're connected to the Moms for Liberty. They're a very powerful group. And I always say, um, if, if you are um, fighting something, you should understand it. So I have links and um, you'll be able to check this out later, but look, take a look at that group. That's one of the big ones. Um, there's another group called No Left Turn in Education that um, says that they want to emphasize the role of the parent as a primary custodian and authority of their child, which I'd say all parents should be, right? But um, they maintain the public book hit list in a school hit list, which I think is very scary, very, um, you know, Orwellian even. I think that they are going to get people. And that's, and that's the thing I'm most afraid of is that um, if we don't work together, groups like this are really trying to uh, get rid of librarians. They really are trying to um, get their agenda put through. So we need to be just as powerful as librarians in fighting this. So the third group I'm gonna mention is the Parents Defending Education. Um, offers step-by-step -step guides to filling out FOIAs and showing up to school board meetings against indoctrination is what they say. So know, know that these groups are out there. And this is, I think, a huge part of it. And I've thought about this a lot lately is that social media has made it so easy for groups to get together and kind of um, plan and strategize about how to um, get what they want to happen. Mm. And um, they're successful. What we need to do is to have our own groups. And, um, and I know sometimes that's hard when you're like already busy, you already are doing everything. I am like, I am wear all the hats. I am the administrator, I'm the cataloger, I am the reference librarian. Um, also now I have to be an expert in intellectual freedom and book challenges. It, it makes it hard, I know, but you don't have to do this alone. And I think that if you work with other librarians in your area, sometimes just, go and talk to people that you know are also interested in and you guys can team up you know you don't have to do anything alone and who else can help there's a lot of groups um your local library associations like in my in minnesota it's a minnesota uh, library association your state library associations are great at helping um if you have a, a teacher's union um often you can get 
um, backing from, uh, they'll, they'll give you support. Um, I am in an intellectual freedom committee in our state. Um, does your state have one? Look, um, we're, we just switched our times just so we can have more K through 12 people um, available to join our meetings. We need to make it so we can all help each other. And that's, and that's why I'm here today too, is I know that um, we all need the, as much support as we can. Um, there's other, um, like every, every library, PEN America, the First Amendment Project, um, you have your local ACLU chapters, the Freedom Re to Read Foundation through ALA, great, uh, National Coalition Against Censorship. Try, try these out, you know, um, Red Wine and Blue, there are a lot of groups that want to help you and you can, and they will walk you through the process. You don't ever have to be alone. Um, you know, even if you like, you know, like attend a presentation, you're like, I know Heather Biederman, she's, she's a passionate person about it. You know what? I may know somebody in your neck of the woods that can help you out. So just reach out, you know, it never hurts to do that. Oops, I think it crashed. Can you still hear me? Yes. Oh, is my thing still showing or did it disappear? <laughs> oh, Lord. Let's see. How do I get that back? Um, so maybe just that your PowerPoint did something. Or I think slide. it crashed. Yep, I see that now. Let me just bring it right back up. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> no, it's okay. Oh. You can have that in, in there. Um, <laughs> that <laughs> Technology. Yeah. Let's see. There we go. Let me go back to where it was. Sorry. We'll go right there. I got off on a tangent too. Okay. Let's okay. see if I can do that slideshow from the current slide. And then I probably gotta switch it again. Yeah. Like that. Okay. There we go. Perfect. Now there we're like. <laughs> Whew. So derailed myself a little bit, it crashed. Um, small and rural libraries like yours and mine, um, we have limited resources. We really have tight-knit communities, but we're, um, the communities can be both good and bad. You know, what we get um, sometimes a little more conservative viewpoints when we're out here. And it's not always an easy sell. You may be the only one who believes a certain way and you may feel like there's a tidal wave of people going against you. I still feel that you need to do your best to try to do what's right. And it's always a challenge when you feel like everyone is going against that. Do your best. But, you know, there are strategies for um, addressing book challenges in small and rural libraries. And I think that it makes it a little bit easier um, number one, I would like you to look at your policies. If you don't have a policy already, it's a surprise, but um, usually the thing that's wrong with the policy not isn't that it, it exists. Um, you may have something, but do you know what it says? Do you know if it um, addresses things like, um, if you have a group that's sending you requests, what if they um, don't live in your area? Do you still take um, challenges to um, a book if it's a parent that doesn't even live in the area or their child doesn't go to the school you teach at um, or in the public library that you work at if it's not in the region do you have something in the policy that says they need to they need to have a library card um, if they are doing a challenge does it have to be a formal written one do you is it enough that you they can just tell you or send you an email uh, do you, um, do they have to have read it? You know, often um, some of the best um, like forms that I've seen at least say, okay, cite where you say the problem is because some of the people putting these um, book challenge requests haven't even looked at the book. They are getting it from a group, a parents group that said, this is horrible. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, what's wrong with it? You know, okay, so form, form review committee. If it's just you, it's just you, but um, it's always good to have another set of eyes. Like if you have a, a parent that comes in, another person, even if it's just another teacher, someone that can just come and sit with, so that way it, it's not escalating and you don't get a he said, she said, you'll have another person to go, yep, 
This is what they said. Um, number three, communicating with the challengers and other stakeholders. Once you uh, once you have the policies, make sure that people know what the policies are. Make sure you um, are very good about um, transparency. Make sure that people know what's going to happen next. How long does it take? Um, where does it go to next? If uh, we can't decide, what's the next step? Make sure that across the board people know. And then um, if you, like let's say you're in a public library, who in your community needs to know? Do you need to report this to the news organizations? Make sure that you know what the process is. And I think it makes it a little more complicated. We have all different kinds of libraries here today. So there's a lot of different ways that it can go. Know, know what it is for you. And then I think it's really good to think about providing alternative resources and promoting diverse perspectives. So you are working with the community, whatever your community is, public, library, if you're a K to 12, like if you're an academic, think about if the person is a problem with this resource, is there another resource that could be useful for them? We're, we're trying to get people to read. We're not trying to push people away from the library. We wanna make sure that they're all a part of it. But at the same time, I'd rather if we could just not be getting rid of books, maybe adding different perspectives to this and, and talk about it. So I think it's a good start. Um, we'll get some comments yeah. here. Um, someone has oh, a, a suggestion yeah. for that. I'm back on your previous slides. Um, sure. but, uh, someone says, I have seen some challenge committees include the students and teens and young adults. The I people think it's who they're, yeah, um, the people that are actually, they're claiming they want to protect. Here are those actual teens and students telling you what they think. I love it. You know, uh, uh, teens are so cool. <laughs> I mean, honestly, you, I you it's like we're like, yeah. trying to protect them and it's like, what do they think about this? You know, well, maybe some of them agree, like, oh, you know, but at least giving them a voice in it, it's very That's democratic. I, I agree. Love it. Yeah. And another, they said in another training, some libraries, they heard that some libraries will include a cost analysis or will have charges to process multiple challenges because of the time, energy, and resources it takes for the library to go through the challenges. That is a perfect point. It's so expensive. You think about what you're paying all these people that are on a, um, a book challenge committee, how much time it takes to go over each book. Sometimes you have everyone reading the book and then discussing it. Um, they're getting paid to do all of that. How many book challenges you have a year? It can get oh, through the yeah. roof and our budgets are already cutting. You know, I, I just don't know how we can keep up with it at that point. And then what about um, the multiple? Like what if, if you've gone through the challenge once, do you do it again every time it comes up? That's, or that's what I say. We have a, I've seen a policy where it says that, um, I think it would, I'm trying to remember, of course, top of my head, something like, if it's already been challenged in the last three years, this particular title, you can't, you can't submit a new challenge for a title that's already been challenged by someone else in the last three years. Um, now the person challenging might not know that, but then the library would tell them, sorry, no, somebody already challenged that one last year and here's the results of it. So we're not doing it again. No, <laughs> we already looked and over it. Might this, we already did be it. smart to have a, like a website or something that talks about um, which books had been challenged and their results. Yep. Um, so they can maybe even just a document that you have somewhere that, so that way people, you know, they can see that you're not just saying, no, we've already done that because <laughs> they're going to be suspicious about it, you know? Um, and it's good to be as transparent as possible. I agree. And that's why having that policy, I cannot emphasize enough how important having a book challenge or book reconsideration policy is. Actually, having policies for everything is important, but in this case, especially get it in writing, have it out there, do it before these things come up to your life. We've never had this happen before. Don't just assume that it will never happen. Be prepared and get that policy written. Look at the ALA, American Library Association has a lot of good resources and info and wording to use. Look at other libraries' policies. They're out there online. Use your- Absolutely. You know, 
and just and it's so important to have it laid out there so if someone does come you've got it all in writing exactly what they are supposed to do do they have to like you yes. said you've got to have read it you have to be one of our actual patrons of our library um, exactly so all these things but it, you can put whatever you want in your policy there is nothing that says what you can and cannot have in your policy so put everything you can in there, possibly think of you're preaching to the choir. It just protects you, honestly. And later you'll be so grateful. You will. If you have it all in place, you will not be sorry that you had it already planned out. Um, and I'd revisit it and see what other people are adding to theirs because um, it's, you know, like what works for you. Do you do it now that things have changed in the climate, in the the way things are going in, in, in our country at least and, and other ones as well, you might need to update it. Definitely take a look at it again. We have a group of school librarians in Minnesota that um, went through their policies against each other. I mean, not against, but with each other to see um, what's working and what isn't. And so that way people don't have to reinvent the wheel. I thought that was very bright and um, a very good idea. That way, you know, like, hey, you know, we just had this challenge and this thing in our policy actually held us back. So we're gonna change it from now on, but um, I wish we had known. And that's the kind of stuff that we need more of is where we do more sharing and help each other out, especially small libraries, you know. Absolutely. Right. Um, so more, you actually like segued perfectly into that yeah. best um, resources that you can have. One of my favorites is Intellectual Freedom Manual. I have it right at my desk yeah. and um, it has so many good things. And the ALA website also has a lot of these resources, but it has, um, how to do policy checklists, um, how to uh, protect your library, um, like example codes of ethics, um, free, and it talks about freedom to read and all these things that I think are just great. Um, it's a good good book to have just because it kind of walks you through the whole process of um, how to get started. So definitely one that I recommend and um, ALA website, perfect for getting started. They have lots of examples like um, setting up your challenge policy purpose um, and having templates. I, I love not having to come up with things on my own because you know, you know I'm not a legal person. I'm not a person that um, like knows everything about um, some of the administration sides of things. So them having these things are great. So this is on the ALA.org tools challenge support site and it talks they have so many great templates that you can use and um you can you can edit it to your own library and see if this will help you so there's a lot of these kind of things there so please do check it out um while you're on that um slide because oh. someone had a question that might like relate to this because here i see there's the resource on which you're commenting in this particular example and it's all physical things that the library has um, this person wants to know, would you suggest adding programs to a challenge policy? For example, I, I had someone upset, and I'm not surprised, sadly, about my D&D &D program, my Dungeons and Dragons program. Of course, people still have don't know. They're like, it's the devil. It's not. Uh, we're past <laughs> but anyway, is that something that this could be part of, or would that be a separate type of policy? I think you can um, have it exactly like that you can um like this one that they have um it says books and digital resources and games you could include it in one it depends on how many forms you really want to have you could have a unique form for each but um i do think that with activities that's like a, it's like kind of a more gray territory because it may be a once a month thing it may be once a year thing uh, there could be, I know um, we had a lot of this in our state for um, the Dread Queen story hour and story time. And um, I think that you will need to have a, a form for that. It, it may just as well be on the same thing, but because um, uh, if you look at uh, the, the template that we have, it's like, what brought this to your attention? Um, have you attended, instead of examined it, have you attended it? Um, so, why do you have a concern? Yeah, so we'll definitely modify it for ballot programs, yeah. Yeah, I would modify it and um, and see see what works because I'm sure other libraries have them already, but um, it, it would be very simple to modify this. I would be prepared for it, just about anything. Anything that they could, like you could be have art that's hanging in your library that somebody like 
has problems with. It could be things that they don't even check out that are just there. People love to complain. So have a form for that. So that way there's a way that you can deal with it. And, it, and then you document it. Because if you don't document it and somebody just takes a complaint and then nothing gets done, that's a valid problem. The, the patrons need to have some sort of outcome. Either it's, we looked at it, we talked about it, but we decided it's staying. At least then they know that you took it seriously and you worked on it. Yeah. Um, if you never let them know again, then they're going to have more hard feelings. And then that's when things snowball out of control. And there's a question here while we're on this form here too, which I think I know the answer to already. Would you require a separate challenge form for each book being challenged? Obviously, I think you have I think to it, look at them one at, uh, case by case. I think you have to. Um, I I know that um, a lot of the big groups that are um, that are targeting um, they'll send whole lists, and I think what's part of the 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 idea behind each book being um, separate is that it makes them fill out the form. Do you really want to? <laughs> how, how much do you want to get rid of this book? And then you're going to have to fill out the paperwork for each one. And I yeah. think they need to put the information in. And I think it's important because each book, each item, each program, whatever is different is going to need to be evaluated separately on a case, like I said, in a case about itself. You can't say this group of titles, this type of book, I want all of these types of books. That's not, they're all so different. There's no way to do that. <laughs> No, right? <laughs> really be meaningful from either side. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's, I like you, your word meaningful in it. And I think that it has to be, it has to um, show both sides. It has to show that, you know, we're not annoyed by it. We, we take it seriously and we want to make sure that it's addressed in a serious way. But if they are just putting it a post-it note and throwing it in a bin on top of a book, like this should be banned and no signature, um, how do we follow up on that? About that, no. I'm like, yeah, that's probably not going to happen. If you really want it, come in and talk to us, and then we can work with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. I want to make sure we get through everything on your slides. Oh yeah, I know. I'm. Uh, yes. Uh, so I'm going to kind of fly through this a little bit, but this is the same kind of idea. It's you should have an action plan. In a preparedness audit. So basically, it's what I'm saying is when you're doing forms, um, getting your institution ready for book challenges. And this is uh, just all levels of preparedness um, from getting the, the, the policies figured out to um, talking to the people in your library, be it you or a group, and how do you deal with it? So um, the preparedness audit is basically a technique for assuring that your goals and policies of collection development, you know, what you're buying is supported by its practices. So that way um, you are not um, like you're you're not having someone abuse you. You're not abusing anyone from the organization and you are protecting yourself from liability and public relations problems, which are all a headache and a nightmare. And we don't want that. So to do that, um, I'm going to send you to the ALA tools again. Please look at the ALA website. It's wonderful. I'm a member of ALA. Um, it's an expensive membership, but I find it's totally worth it. Um, they have the challenge support page, has everything about how to do challenge reporting, how to deal with challenges and concerns, how to um, do formal requests, and how to, um, they have a report censorship toolkit that I think is really useful, and I totally welcome you to play with this because it will get you brainstorming what's going to work for your organization, and it's a great start. Um, definitely play with that. Um, step two, getting buy-in. Talk to everyone who would have a challenge, be it your management team. Um, make sure that they know that these things are coming. Um, if you work with city council or library board, talk to them about what do we do when we get book challenges? Prepare. Um, if you already had them, like now that we've had a book, a book challenge, um, is there anything we should do differently? Um, definitely talk to the librarians, the volunteer services people. Um, make sure that parent groups, oh, they can be your greatest advocates. If you have people who are passionate about reading, get them on your side, people. These are the ones we need. We need our own army. We need, we need people that are going to help us. So definitely 
definitely get buy-in from everyone. And then, you know, start with the collection development policy. Um, make sure that um, if somebody's like, why are you buying these racy books? You go, well, it's not a racy book. And this is um, how it fits into our collection. And we have thought about everything. And this is why. You know, so make sure that you have um, the ALA as a selection and reconsideration policy toolkit for public school and academic libraries. Great resources. Great, great, great. And prepare your staff. This is something that I think um, we skip over because we're so busy. But um, I would say even like sit down and do um, role play a little bit. Go have one person be the angry parent and, and like, how, how do you react? How, how do you get people to calm down? Make sure that you aren't rolling your eyes. Make sure you're breathing. Make sure you're not clenching and looking angry. Don't point, don't do stuff like that. Just be, you know, sometimes just sitting down with people is good. And, you know, sometimes a standing, you get people that cross their arms you know really look open you know in the inside you might be screaming and it's okay to scream on the inside but don't show it with your face and <laughs> acknowledging their concerns is sometimes all they need they don't yes. want to take that extra step of officially putting in the paperwork and the complaint or the challenge but they just want you to know i'm concerned about this and you can explain to them like you said this is our collection development policy this is why we have these particular titles um no you're correct this is not a good book for your child because you've decided it's not but it may be for another parent absolutely you don't decide for other parents what yeah they well, and why would somebody feel like they can decide for everyone <laughs> i'm just having a conversation yeah um yes. diffuses the whole situation I love that, and it just makes things a lot smoother. Um, and and, I, and that is one thing that I've really worked on over the years is like calming down uncomfortable situations. It's a, it's a skill. So if you're not comfortable with that, that's something to work on. You know, it's it's we're not perfect on any of this. And no matter how prepared you think you are, and you get the wrong person coming in and yelling at you the wrong way, it can throw off your game. So. Mm -hmm. Play pretend a little bit and see see how you would deal with it if somebody was yelling at you about something or or in a in a weird way you know so you know we we can work on that together and then you perform your audit just have a timeline you know always put something on it every month you know like what am I going to work on this week that has to do with our audit. And, and make sure that it's something you're, you're reviewing. Maybe you need to like update it, make recommendations, work on it, just do it, right? Just do it. And then tell the story of what you did. How, how did you do it? Um, write, it write down how the process went um, and was it necessary? Did it work? How did it work out? And then talk to other librarians. See, see if um, they have ideas on how to make things better. Because I'm going to say, like in a small library, I don't know everything there is because I, I talk to people, I learn a lot, but I've never had to go through it in a public library setting before. So you may have a different experience than I have. So talk to each other, um, share what you know. And then what's next? You integrate it, regular checkups, staff training, if if something didn't work when it happens every time every time you have a book challenge come in talk to each other go what how did it go do you feel like it went well should is there stuff we should be working on to make it better it, it's it's an ongoing process and there's nothing wrong with that when you're a small library you do the best you can but being prepared will take a lot of that the pain away from it and i really encourage you to do that so these are, again, some of the resources for um, who can help, like PEN America. Um, I had um, like intellectual freedom committees. I think that it's just a good thing. So what I want you to do, keep up with intellectual freedom news first. Know what's coming. Um, uh, if you Google um, intellectual freedom committee news, um, at American Library Association, every Friday they come out with new news and it is um, the, the book challenge section has exploded in the last few years, but you can see what's happening. And if there are things that are going on in your state, um, notice it because that means it's getting closer and closer to you. 
So be ready to attend meetings. Um, get to get out there, put your face out there, talk to other librarians, um, be on the Intellectual Freedom Committee, start your own Intellectual Freedom Committee if there isn't one in your state. Get it going and then work on book challenges to support each other. That's oh, you guys have to. You know, I, I that's I'm I don't think of librarians as being meek at all. We are fierce when it comes to this, so we can help each other. Get the word out in your community. Um, get the people that really want to um, participate and help you out, and we can we can get them in on our fight. And um, one of the things I um, always encourage people, both librarians and not library, is the United Against Book Bans movement. Anyone can join, and um, they are working really hard to um, fight the book bans. And we need a united front, you know? And mm -hmm. we have more questions. Yes, yes, we do have lots of comments and questions that have come in, um, definitely. Um, this is a very, uh, uh, I don't know what the right word, but any, it's lots of stuff's going on in this. Yes, it's it's, it's exploding in this country and not this country, but probably everywhere. Um, and it is a concern for um, libraries. Uh, so some things I'll just read off here that uh, someone suggested also another helpful resource is your uh, state library. I'm not sure if you had that on your slide. Your yes. Your, your state library, library um, your, your actual state library is a great resource. They usually have um, more the legal side. Um, yes. There's often legislative, legislative days that you can go for libraries, um, talk to your leaders. Yeah, we have our advocacy day. Ours is coming up in March here in Nebraska, where it's a day where we, um, librarians across the state, go come to the Capitol and have lunch and speak with their senators about library issues of all types, any type of library concerns or promoting Minnesota's is next week. That's a wonderful thing to be a part of. And yeah. that's your, you have a captive audience of all your legislators. So yeah. like use that. <laughs> and we feed them lunch. Well, we don't do it. Our state association does it, but let their food feed, feed lunch. So they, yeah. <laughs> food <laughs> you know you get the best of everything you get to talk about library stuff and have food and you know captive audiences it's, it's perfect and um something i think you just mentioned in that previous slide about steps to do someone wants to know about do you know of libraries have been proactive in building advocacy and awareness about all this before challenges come up so it seems like something that you know go out into community I mean, community conversations um so don't just wait um for something to happen, and then it suddenly blows up your community. You, as a library, be proactive and start having the discussions. Is that something you that you've seen or heard of libraries doing? Oh yeah, um, there are so many that are very worried about what's coming, and they see it in the in the state next over. Um, we're we're seeing um, like laws that are being written as we speak that are. Um, definitely a challenge to our freedom to read and um, will encourage book bans um, at a state level, which I don't think is a good idea at all. Um, yes, we need to be very proactive. And sometimes you may not think of everything, but uh, you, I think it's always good to get out there and um, work together to try to prevent headaches later. It, it saves a lot of time. Yeah, let your community know what um, you're already doing, what you are, that you already know that this is an issue and that you are prepared. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's see what we got here. Um, hmm. All right. With uh, here's a, multiple questions here from this one person. Uh, with the anti-science perspective of some of these groups. Um, are, the, are there books being challenged on climate science? Um, are the books oh, yeah. also, are they also attacking some books on history? I think we know the answer to that. <laughs> I mean, I've heard of um, people who like thought the like things in history didn't happen and um, that we didn't walk on the moon and that there um, there's conspiracy theories. And, you know, um, I'd say that there are some things that it's good to have two points of view, but there are some things that are actually incorrect. And That's that you can say, this is a collection development issue that um, we do not put things in our library that are actually incorrect. 
Mm -hmm. and, that, and that if you have it in your policy, then you don't have as much of a fight as if you didn't. <laughs> and yes, you are. You're absolutely right. There are ha there it will. If there's something that people can complain about, they will. Um, but um, that is a big one. A medical after um, like the pandemic, there was a lot of um, um, like vaccination and that kind of thing. It, it, mm -hmm. every, anything you can think of, people will complain about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's definitely, there's going to be people that, that don't, think their point of view, sh their, their, something they think of, if there's a conspiracy or whatever, should be, uh, libraries are supposed to be impartial, supposed to be neutral um, to, to excess, <laughs> and they should have books on anything that anybody has written. Um, yeah. but, well, we don't have to. <laughs> that's what I mean, if you, it's a huge thing. We weed out things that have become old, outdated, not just like it's old as far as like uh, physical condition because they're so used, but old as in this information is no longer correct or this information, you know, but this should also never collect things that are incorrect to begin with. Yes, absolutely. Um, um, and that's a good thing to think about, too, is what you have in your collection. Why do you have that in your collection? If you have things that are um, incorrect, what are you doing about it? <laughs> um so a good uh um top uh, recommendation here oh someone just comments that uh you're talking about sharing possibly putting together a database and sharing what um book challenges you've had and someone commented that there is a library in texas that has done this um Ains, yeah. Ains, westlake school district i don't know if i pronounced that right they created a book challenge database on the school's website that includes books challenged who made the challenge and the board's decision with each one full transparency and i went to it it's great it's just a list a huge list um but it's got yeah you can see exactly um what the decision was what the book was and everything that happened with it so um that's a great resource or a great example. That's what I was trying to think of the word. That's <laughs> wonderful. I'm going to go play with that one. I, I remember that. I remember reading that. That's E A N E S E E A N E S Westlake School. West. E oh, that's so great. Um, and you have the link here. And, you, and again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, and you can see what other libraries are going through, and you know. It, if you if they're having the challenges, you're probably going to see them in similar titles. It's a lot of the same books over and over, so mm -hmm. it's you can see if you have them in your collection. The, the the weird part of me is almost like, oh, we don't have that one. I kind of want it now. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a becoming a side effect here. We we're hearing about books that we didn't know that were out there because there's so many titles. I mean, there's just oh, there's no. books, for, but there's also and we talked about this in a previous session today we can't have every book in our library <laughs> um that's why interlibrary loan exists and we love it um of course yes <laughs> <laughs> but uh you will find you know, learn some new titles that maybe you know you might want to share with um at least so that they know that exists if you can't necessarily purchase it for your library if your teens or adults whoever is looking for a particular topic hey i know of a book that exists let me get it for you from another library it'll be here in a couple of days i mean well, and then that was the other thing I had, um, that reminded me of is that um, some organizations are um, digitizing some of these banned books and putting them available in a um, mostly free way. Um, they're donating it. Um, the Brooklyn Public Library. The right. thing. Yes. Anyone so, who in the country who's a teen can get uh, access to their um, books online. Um, you just submit an application, tell them why you want it, and um, you have access to it. So there's a workaround. <laughs> so if, if things get really bad, librarians will come up with a way to, to make it a little bit better. Um, and I think we're gonna wrap up with this last question, which is, <laughs> uh, I don't know if I say it's loaded, but it's, it's a, anyway. Uh, how do you stay positive in the face of this terrifying force that is so detrimental to the work that we do? because we love helping our students and our patrons and it's all about them. It's sometimes you, it's really easy to lose your way because you see all these negative things coming at you. 
but when you have a student come at you and say, this book, I know it was challenged, but it changed my life. I was so glad that we had it. Thank you for having it. And thank you for standing up for me. It will make your heart just grow a hundred times and it is so worth it. So please do, um, you're going to feel a little, oh, I was going to say dissuaded and it's probably stronger than that. More overwhelmed. Overwhelmed is definitely very overwhelmed. Like, how can I do anything? What, what can I do? And, and part of it is too, the people, if they are your actual, your own patrons, not coming from outside the community, they're also your base as well. That's and right. they are coming to you and saying, I, I am concerned about this book. I don't like it. I don't want it to be here at all. And they're also one of your patrons. You want, you want everybody to love the library and it hurts when they don't. You can't make everyone happy. People that are, you're one of our patrons and you don't like that we offer this for someone else. I mean, mm, mm. It's like, what can I get for you though? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, don't make other people lose their, or oh, I had a friend who said, don't yuck their yum, you know, like um, just, we'll get the yums for you. How about that? And they can have their yum and everyone's happy, right? Everyone Maybe can have not. something they like from the library and um, that they don't like in the library. And that's okay. Don't, don't use the stuff you don't like. Yeah, just don't use it. Don't read the stuff you don't like. How hard is that? But I think it's a good start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then just a last comment. Thank you for addressing this important issue. Well, we're, we're happy to do so. Happy to have Heather on here to give us some guidance um, or something Thank that we you. are all having to deal with, yeah. I am so thrilled to get to talk to you about this. And um, I have up on the screen my email address. If you have other thoughts or questions or you just want, want the slides right away, send me a note and I'll send it to you. Um, I will be um, sending this so we can post it on the site. So yep. you can play with all the links at, at your own will. Mm -hmm. And I am happy to help. Yeah, we will have all this available. As I said, um, with the recordings, the slides will be available, but it will take me some time. So if you, any of you can't wait the week or so it takes me to do this, you're welcome to reach out to any of the presenters and they will be happy to send things to you ahead of time. But eventually we will, I will have it all up on the on the site for anyone. So, thank so you. This thank was you a lot so of fun. Yes, <laughs> thank you so much, Heather. Thank you, everybody, for all of your um, interaction for this um, session. Um, thank you. Have a great rest of the day.